It is June the 17th, 2023. I'm Chris and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Sometimes I'm really glad that people don't see the pre-show and uh, misfires of different weird buttons that I press that I should be pressing. Hey, I'm Chris. We have another episode of The Future of Photography and Adrian is with me. Hello. Hi, how you doing? Doing good. Doing good. Doing Do, pressing all sorts things. of buttons at your <laughs> pressing end. Pressing yes. buttons and doing whatever. Ah, <laughs> uh, it <laughs> is a Saturday. We, we record. We're recording at a different time than usual, so that might, I don't know, change the dynamic. Maybe. I have no idea. Um, so, well, sadly, Absolutely. no Jeremiah today. He's been on a, a night shoot again. Um, actually, I'm not quite sure. He might still be because we're about three hours usually earlier than usual. So he probably just crawled into bed or something like that at the end of the night shoot. Very, very likely. He said he'd be shooting till 5 a.m. Oh. So, well, uh, See, uh, see, if only he'd made Baywatch instead of a vampire program, right? He could have just been on the beach near home <laughs> all day, right? You know, I mean, it didn't have to, uh, Baywatch is a bit suspect at this point, right, in, in, in the new world. But, but the, um, you yeah. know. And it's easier, it's easier to light up a dark area than to darken down a bright area when you do outside shoots that are supposed to happen at night. That's true. Yes, that is true. Light, light, light works in mysterious ways. <laughs> so apparently you know, does Jeremiah. Yes. <laughs> you, you know what else works in mysterious ways? Editing. Editing photos. Oh, seamless. Um, so, uh, yes, editing. So uh, I've been playing with a new editing tool recently and it works a little bit different. It took me a little while to get my head around it and that made me think do you know what there's there's a whole new way of doing things have you uh, have you been playing with this ai stuff again so not no well not <laughs> no this is not what that is about this is about photo editing right so whether or not there are any complex algorithms in the software is a matter for the engineers and then the marketing department so um yeah, it, it, that's not what this is about, but it's, it's more about the ways of working. Um, so, although having said that, the tool I have I have recently purchased uh, is Luminar Neo. Uh, and so, yes, that is a tool that is heavily marketed as containing lots of AI. And, but actually, and last week, last week when we talked about um, Apple's new stuff, um, I think one thing we noted is that while there is plenty of AI in things or machine learning or whatever you want to call it, um, they approach this more from a feature perspective, from a how is it useful and not from a, we have AI, we have AI, we have AI, as some others do. So um, I, th I think with the advent of these kind of technologies creeping into everything, it will be very similar to, again, how we, how we changed our, uh, how we call photography at one point, we used to call it uh, photography, and then we used to call it digital photography, and now we're calling it photography again. So, um, <laughs> who knows? New tools will be the norm, right? Well, yeah. So, so well, let, let's let's dive in then, because there's, I mean, Luminar Neo is on our list to talk about today. That so are a couple of other tools, which, as far as I'm aware, are not saying that they are AI related. Uh, and as you say, the the, the Luminar Neo one is is not about that. So, um. Uh, do, do you have Luminar at all? Any of the versions no. of Luminar? No. Okay. So, no. Um, well, for, for you then, and for those that don't, um, the uh, Luminar has lots of sliders, as you might expect, all of the usual ones, but then it has things like enhance light and improve face and adjust eyes and replace sky. Uh, it, it has layers, although it took me a while to get my head around how it uses layers because it's not the sort of thing that you'd see in a, in a Photoshop app or, or equivalent um which well, sort of is but for different use cases and then i couldn't figure out how to use the same tool twice because it's not like lightroom where you can create a uh, a, a select a, uh, a selective edit you know with a, either a a gradient or a radial or whatever and then edit you know all the same sliders within that that area so it's, it's quite a, a quite a different thing um for for a while i was like i can't get i can't do this at all i actually had to go look stuff up it turns out actually, which, which happened to me when I when I switched from Photoshop to uh, Affinity Photo, which had a few, like some of my muscle memory just didn't work anymore. 
Yeah, this right. this is yeah, it's it, it's an interesting one. But or, it is it ju- it, or is it a very different paradigm? Because if if I look at Photoshop versus um, Affinity Photo, they have the same paradigm. There's layers. There's like different ways you you you, you combine them. But the general underlying paradigm is the same. It's just the uh, different. Yes. Like ways to do this, but you, you're saying this is a very different paradigm. It's a general. different approach. Yeah. So so I mean, Affinity. Let's face it. Affinity was Affinity Photo. Sorry. Um, was deliberately designed to behave very, very much like Photoshop, such that they could lure users away from Photoshop. Um, Luminar is different. So uh, a layer, for example, would be used when you do a sky replacement. So mm-hmm. you'd pick a new sky, and it would, you know, you'd say, say you know, the, the way the software works is that you, you sort of browse through a catalogue of skies. I, I'm assuming you can add your own skies, but I haven't got that deep into it yet. Um, and, and then you choose one and it, what it does is it automatically works out in your photograph where the sky is uh, and creates a new layer with the new sky. And I think it's basically doing some automated masking uh, between the new layers. But the, the, the way you use it is very different. You don't say, oh, I would like to create a new layer and I would like to put a sky on. You just say, you know, sky replacement, please. Um, and, it, and it'll do the job of figuring out where the sky is and... Yeah, it just, it, without, yes. without you having to tell it, it just, yes. that's the function. So, so without using the, the, the magic two little letters, it automatically assesses your photograph and it creates zones for things like foreground, background, man-made, buildings, people. Semantic segmentation is the, is the magic word here. Yeah, and it does that automatically. So it does that automatically, finds the sky and then creates a new layer and does it. So that's a difference in a... In a in the user interface and actually it's it's quite it's much more that particular example is it's much more um task oriented or outcome oriented rather than it is process oriented so a lot of the tools you'll find in photoshop and and lightroom and others are very process oriented they're like i would like to work on the shadows now or i would like to work on the curve now this one is i would like to replace it I, my outcome is i would like a different sky and please help me do that with as few clicks as possible so that's one example another example is the way that it tracks edits so it creates a, a history so you you can't do um you can't really do selects as such in uh it you can't say oh i'd like to apart from with the 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 automated masking i suppose you could you can brush in a mask but when you try and go back to a tool and say oh i'd like to do uh, i'd like to change the exposure but i'd like to change it in two different parts of the the picture um that confused me because i was like okay well i've used the exposure slider already but how do i then say i'd like to do that in a different place with a different mask and and, and do it, use it a second time and it, it turns out there's a whole other sort of list that you can get which is the edits that you've applied and when you go back to a tool it creates a new instance of that tool in the background and lets you start afresh and you can create a new mask and things like and it's like but it but it was really different um and it good um and, and it just got me but, to thinking but, but but once you wrapped your head around it it was was it natural after that? Uh, yes it is yes it's 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 um do you know what it reminded me of a little bit is snapseed mm-hmm. so you know when you go into the history edit in snapseed you can have more tools yeah or every tool can be used more than once uh, and you just pick the hit yeah the, the point in the history where that particular adjustment was made it's that that's what it reminded uh that's what it reminded me of so so but it got me to thinking in the broader scheme because the other thing i've seen that prompted this conversation today is that capture one have just launched their mobile app and as far as i can work out it's got nothing to do with photo editing at all it's all to do with collaboration sharing images in the you know tethering sharing images in a photo shoot getting your client feedback in near real time as you're progressing these things it's all, it's more like the sort of thing you'd see I guess on a, a movie set where you're pushing the images around to different people so they can do their checks on it all and stuff like that. So that was interesting as well, I thought. Um, I haven't played with Capture One, uh, the, either the mobile app or the, or the desktop app. Um, I understand the desktop app is very good. Uh, but uh, And the, the first few things I've been reading on the mobile app are there's some, some mixed reviews. I think it didn't quite meet people's expectations for what they wanted out of a Capture One mobile app. Uh, but it's an interesting way of thinking. 
Um, By the way, you just you just made, took this comparison between uh, Luminar and Snapseed. You mm. know why that is? You know is where the, the similarity same? comes from? It's the same people. Is it really? Well, it, it goes back to Nick Software, German Nick Software, who um, yes. made Snapseed. And then I think, I don't know who owns it now, but... Um, and then they were... Their, their software plugin suite was sold to Google. And then they went and became Skylum. Oh, I thought they Skylum got bought out by DXO. Um, well, Sk Skylum used to be uh, at least a lot of Nick people. Ah, um, okay. Founded or, or joined uh, uh, Skylum. Because Skylum, uh, Skylum, Skylum is, a, is a Ukraine-based company, isn't it? And they have different offices now, I believe. But I think they started out in Ukraine. De definitely, definitely possible. But uh, it, it it at least has some same DNA. Interesting. So that's say, why yeah. some of these things. So yeah, because I mean, the the thing that was always amazing about Nick Software was that what they call their U point technology, wasn't I it? Love Which that. again, Be different paradigm smart, again. Smart layering, ch smart choices. Yeah. Smart, smart masking. Yeah, much, yeah. That, that was awesome. And then you got a little bit of that in Snapseed, didn't you, with a few few tools, yep. but not, not quite in the same way. Um, but that would explain. That would explain it. it. Does, well, there yeah. you go. Interesting. Interesting stuff. So... Question. Question. I had for this. Oh, sorry. One more example. But then, 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 then discuss. Um, the the other example is is uh, an app that my wife is using a lot at the moment, which is called CapCut. And never Cap heard of Cut, it. Well, it's kind of a non-linear video editor, but it's very much focused on the production of reels. So it's for so for social media. So you edit, but you're you're editing your video, but you're layering on your stickers and your text and, and mm, things like that. So at least that's. I mean, it may have more use cases than that, but that's that's the one that I think a lot of people the the use case a lot of people use it for. Um, and so again, like Capture One and like ne Luminar Neo, there is a reason these three are the three that I've picked because I'm there's a thread through them for me which is that they are very much outcome focused. Whereas our traditional editing tools are much more process focused, whether they be Lightroom or Photoshop or Affinity Photo or e even something like Nick Software, right? Yeah, that we just mentioned. Um, all very open-ended and, and process focused and you could do these amazing things and you can affect the tones and you can affect the colors. And it's like, what if sometimes you just want to get to the finish point? <laughs> I don't know about you. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm in my mind. I'm comparing this to uh, Boeing versus Airbus. Uh, oh, I had, I, yeah. I, I had over over the years, I had um, various pilots on my workshops, and uh, one of them, and I think mostly Airbus pilot, he told me when i asked him what what's the difference he said yeah well boeing is is very t well again this was like 20 years ago so it might have changed now but uh at that point boeing was boeing airplanes were mainly like okay this is the yoke this is the throttle this is whatever and you um you have to balance everything and with an airbus you have a joystick and if you want to make it go up then you pull on the joystick and the <laughs> plane does everything to go up and it will of course tell you if it's physically impossible but um if you if you if you want to take a right turn then you tilt that joystick to the right and the plane does a right turn uh, within the limits of physics and whatever but yeah, yeah. um so so it is very outcome focused very like i want to go there i point it there um as that's opposed a, to if i want to take a right turn i have to press this pedal and turn this and change that and do i don't know whatever you do when you fly a plane so that's that's my understanding um that we are now going with photo editing going more into an airbus future do you, do you remember that scene in the movie independence day where will smith gets into the alien fighter and he has a post-it note with arrow like backwards and forwards, up and down. And he sticks it on the dashboard and he pulls the joystick and it does completely the wrong thing. And he gets it and he turns the post-it note upside down and sticks it back on the dashboard. <laughs> it's like, that's, that's the way I've bit, got to do it. That's a bit like scroll scrolling direction between windows and... <laughs> it is, yeah, definitely. <laughs> 
So yeah, so the so the the thing that I thought would be interesting is, I mean, you know, the 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 um, pseudo controversial question of the day is is does that mean that all of our major league photo editing tools are just old school? Are they Boeing compared to Airbus? Right? Um, should we all be thinking about different tool sets? And if so, what would you and I uh, like those things to be able to do for us? Hmm. So, so when I look at my own photo workflows, again, I'm I'm a, I'm a weird hybrid because I do everything. I'm not Luminar, okay, but I, it's it's 100 based on on the circumstance. Like, what the end for me is usually what helps the story. Like, is okay. it the composition that needs to be a certain way? Is it the colors in the photos, the contrast, the the vignetting, or the timing, or something? And then, of course, it comes down to what do I shoot with, because I mean, there are the two avenues here, the, the iPhone photos and the, in air quotes, real photos, yeah. um, which doesn't really, it, it doesn't really work like that anymore. But no, really. anyway, so, so it's still a different environment. So iPhone photos go into iCloud photos and uh, I either shoot for fun and then I don't want to fiddle with them in any way. So I might use something like Argentum or something else with filters that just do something for me. And then I don't I don't won't really do anything to these photos. It's WYSIWYG. What you get is so what you see is what you get and then that's it. Okay. Or or I I shoot in raw, which I do often on the iPhone, which is when you enable that, it's only one tap away directly up, up on the on the photo screen. So but then again, do I need this for the story? Do I need this for, I don't know. For example, color correction is easier with raw photos because it doesn't bake anything weird in and, under and LED lights, for example. Do, do you shoot actual raw or do you shoot Apple Pro raw, which, is, Apple any, Pro which raw. is anything but raw? <laughs> I know, I know. It has raw components and it lets you re-edit things without making them worse. So That's true. In um, that sense, yes, you're editing for, the real For all intents and purposes, it is as raw as it as I need it in that context. Yes, um, yeah, fair point. So, yeah, editing, re-editing. And those photos do rarely go into still my main editing suite, which is Lightroom, which has all my... In, air quotes again proper photos because it does not only hold those photos it also holds all the metadata and everything for it so it's rather difficult to just step outside of that um and then i have i have a few very goal selected editing steps in lightroom that are typically around the ai built-in tools like subject selection or background selection oh, okay. So on, okay because that that's an ai thing mm -hmm. or if i stitch uh, something together and there's stuff missing there's a context aware fill for the corners and that's the typical ai based stuff um, but then uh, other than that i'm very traditional there i mean I, I correct the composition maybe i straighten something or i crop or clone something out um i do my contrasts and black point white point curves adjustment a bit of dehaze maybe if i want the contrast to be a bit more interesting but it's it's a very it's it's a very proven workflow and uh it's also a thing that it gives me a lot of control i know exactly where it's going to go so in that whereas and this is maybe more of a boring approach whereas with a airbus approach you put you push the joystick and you hope it goes where you want to go, <laughs> which it does. It says not how it works, of course. Um, but I am I'm very control focused when I do when I work on my photos. Uh, okay, and of course the skill that I've uh, worked on for decades helps me do all this abstraction, all this all this mental work without yes. really thinking about it yeah. to to come to the right motions and the right buttons and the right sliders to to get to that result that does not happen by just sitting in front of it it it, it takes ages to yeah and and to i suspect it. if i was if i was to 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 use lightroom today it would probably be very different from however many years ago it was that i last used it because when i last used lightroom None of that new modern stuff about smart selects and, and things. Like, stuff. Yeah, it was was in there. So so <laughs> my definitely my my understanding of that particular product is is old at this point. Okay, so what about 
beyond the editing then what about the uh the 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 public uh, publishing the production right so not so so not the editing so much but the production whether it be for uh, for for a print, a single print, or a group of things, or whether it be for for some other kind of output, do you do you use, for example, Lightroom and uh, you know soft proofing in, in on your computer so that you mm-hmm. can tell what it's going to look like and you can adjust the print and things like that? Yes, I do that, but but again, it, it really it really depends on how I approach it. I would not be against having a system that I throw in all my photos and tell it, um, please make all the skies nice and please make sure there are no no weird blemishes on people's chins and things like that. Um, so, but but only if they then do what I would would be doing, or what the or if they get to the a very similar result to what I would be getting to. Yeah. So okay. maybe 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 I need a system that I can train on my edits, on my editing. I've given them a whole bunch of before and after pictures of my library. As in as in here, Ooh. as in show it, here's my Lightroom. You have all the edit history of all the photos in there. Go figure it out. Go figure Chris out. And then I'd have an AI Chris that I can turn into my <laughs> photo editing butler. That's really interesting as well. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, that could be quite cool, couldn't it? Because, um, you know, for, for me, I, I do have a certain style and a certain way of doing things. Not always, but context dependent. They are very similar often, as in landscape photos will typically see a similar treatment other than night photos, other than portraits. So, mm. yeah, I I want that. I want that. I want. I want a training system. Give it. Give it a. I don't know. Give it four days of CPU time, GPU time, NPU time, to rattle through my catalog and come back with with a Robo Chris. That'd be interesting. To, yeah, that that would be really interesting. So, so what you're saying there is, is you would then say to Robo Chris, you know, um, I I want this collection of 12 photos you know uh, readied for printing at whatever size you know on whatever paper and it would just go away and and do the majority for of it of the work for you that that, that would be one workflow as in okay here, here's what i need of course gpt oh huh? i can just talk to it i don't have to specify a, a syntax or something i just tell it okay here's 20 photos of that and that event um have them ready for my my usual style with my usual style um ready to print um hmm. and then but then of course i want to evolve i want to change my style over time i want to adapt things so um i definitely need to be able to tell it that okay apply my usual style but um give me give me three variations one with a more greenish tint in the shadows and one with more I don't know, and one with uh, with with blown out highlights for a stylized look. Like so that. that's interesting. So one of the th- yeah, one of the things I had to do learning a new tool, learning l- l- how to get stuff out of Luminar Neo the last couple of weeks, is you do have to to learn how to get to that type of outcome. It's like okay, so so actually, where and part of it is user interface, and part of it is when you find the tool. How does that tool work? How do you deliver your personal mental image using the, the the various different sliders and buttons and what have you that the tool has available? So it would be interesting to yeah, it'd be interesting to say it it, it yeah uh you, you know I, to just be able to say I want to nudge yeah you know, the, the the leaves in that tree are a bit too yellow. Can you nudge them to the green a bit, please? Right or exactly uh, yeah or, uh, and and or and I and like I, I go back to okay this this one goes back to a documentary I watched because I've never really worked in a professional capacity in a proper analog dark room it was only a hobby for me but mm. um, I watched um, what's the documentary War Photographer it's okay. about James Nachtwey and mm-hmm. he's um, and and he prepares for an exhibition and the way he does that is of course he has a lot, a lot of small prints and then he arranges them to make sure he figures out the right 
order and grouping for for the exhibition space and then he has them printed in big and he goes um, and he works with a printer with a person who goes in mm -hmm. the dark room and he tells the printer I need it this way and could you make the sky a bit darker and then and then the printer goes into the dark room and does all his magic and dodging and burning and waving things in front of the light uh, projected light and so on and print comes back and then he goes ah this is quite good but could we could we darken that part down a bit more and this one so this conversation i want to have that conversation with uh with a robot with robo chris with robot interesting yeah and and of course that would then be an instant change you go okay um can you make this guy a bit more gritty can we have a bit more definition in the clouds could we have uh, and then and then of course you, you can think of anything like okay could, could you make that person's nose a bit smaller <laughs> and the ears a bit a bit closer to the head and uh, so okay cut, so, cut so the hair cut the hair shave him shave him <laughs> so so there are some tools in luminar neo that can do some of that sort of stuff not in mm -hmm. not with that user interface that you've just described so you know you could you, there are, there is a tool for face adjust for example where you yep. can actually make the face a little bit thinner and when you and in the eye tool you can choose how bright you want the irises a bit so how, yeah, how bright and how colorful you want the irises to be and you don't have to select those you just go into the eye tool and say right you know i want the eyes to be brighter please or or, or something like that and the face to be a bit thinner you don't have to do any selecting all of that happens automatically in the background but the it's definitely not a chatty user interface it's definitely still a set of tools so so uh, i'm sure the chatty user interface could be put into it Actually, well, so, we, hmm. let's 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 go even further i, I want i want to i want to push this even further into the future but it. maybe not that far remember last well second last week we talked about the um, the MRI scanner that was mind reading, that was yeah, uh, yeah. reconstructing pictures mm -hmm. that people were thinking of. Why can't that be a reconstruction of your thought? Make, give, give the sky more, uh, more definition. Uh, make the nose bigger. That my um, work feet, my thoughts are not that coherent. So, <laughs> but that's that's on the system to figure out. But just, my thoughts just, would be more like pressing the random button. <laughs> <laughs> think, think of looking at that picture, looking at that sky with your eyes and thinking about how that sky could be different, then seeing the change happen in front of your eyes. I, yeah. This is in reach. This, this is, is Blade Runner again, in, isn't it? This no, is Blade Runner enhanced, isn't it? It's like, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah, maybe, maybe it is. Because, but no, but Blade Runner Enhance was very process oriented again. Remember when he goes and says, move the camera to left, yeah, move that's it true. up, yeah, go yeah. deeper, to enhance the process. So that was more of a process with a voice interface. What we're thinking of is a process, uh, is, a, is a look at this and it changes according to what you think about. Mm. This... this uh, this could, this does not sound like it will be here in two weeks, but I could imagine this no. to be around in twenty years, fifty years. But you could, yeah, and you could. That's interesting. But it, um, that is, yeah, yes, because and if you just you could say things like add motion blur to everything except the subject. But, and it, but, it, I, no, no, no. That's not what it. you say. You say um, make this a panning shot. The subject is X. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you and then it adds the motion blur, and then you say. Uh, that's 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 not not blurred enough. Okay. okay. And then the blur becomes a bit stronger. So so let's th let's let's think about that. What the, the, that last few minutes from a, a the point of view of an editing paradigm, right? Because mostly we've been talking about UI rather than the approach. But I think the approach is in there as well, which is that yeah, you know, what you're saying is you you have a create you, you have a creative vision. And you're, so you're not thinking about, you know, whether I want to, I mean, we have vocabulary available to us today, like dehaze or clarity or curves or, you know, blacks, whites, shadows, highlight, you know, we have all of that vocabulary available to us. But actually, what you, know, you could imagine saying, you know, um, you could imagine an editing paradigm that bl blended all those together, right? So, in order to achieve your pan shot, for example, it would have to add. It would have to isolate the subject. It would have to um, essentially invert the selection. Um, it would have to add a motion blur. 
it, it probably would need to ask you whether you wanted it to blur left or right <laughs> um yeah and by how much and things like that but you could uh, uh but it would have to do multiple things wouldn't it in order to do that okay all right i, I think you definitely um definitely still something uh, definitely definitely a different way of doing it there just a couple of things that i had thought of which maybe not quite so user interface based but be thinking before the show so i i mean you you're reading it back into what is actually possible right um, now um yes and no because what you said i think is going to be possible very very soon right isn't it because we we know that that is coming maybe not the thinking about it and it just happens but maybe the but the user interface that you tell what you want uh, definitely 100 yeah. percent, definitely yeah. yes so but I, I i which is a really interesting thought um I, I have been thinking about actually you know having tools available to us that facilitated an outcome so i mentioned printing already um it, it's uh and i've been doing some inkjet printing recently and uh most of the tools that I use, in fact, all the tools I use, none of them have soft proofing in it. So there is a little bit of trial and error, but that's OK, because I'm not doing anything massively drastic. Although sometimes I'm pushing the edits a little bit far and they turn out a bit mushy on the printer. So I have to do another print and stuff like that. So but that's all OK. I'm happy with that. But something like uh, making a zine or a book, you know, something like that, there are very few tools that will take you from... You know, your raw photo library through the process of, of making a book there used to be i don't know if it's still bits in lightroom because i say i haven't used it for years there used to be stuff in apple photos but they took that away um it'd be nice to have something that was really you know that could help you out when i when i did the zine i did last year i was using the uh, the affinity tools and that worked really well because if you're working and i'm sure adobe will do this as well but when i was working in affinity designer which is their layout program or is it publisher no it's publisher sorry affinity publisher which is the the layout program so equivalent of adobe in design i think um you could if you wanted to that, that was all about placing images placing text moving things around sizing it getting you know you know um getting it all nicely laid out and then if you thought oh those two photos i've placed next to each other don't quite match i need to edit one of them you you would select the photo and literally just press the photo persona button and it would immediately flip all of the um interface into affinity photo and you would edit your photo and then you'd flip back into the publisher persona and your photo would just be there all edited and the, the applications work s seamlessly together it was a really nice experience now i wouldn't say that that was facilitating a, a workflow perhaps it's making available all the tools in an integrated way to to allow you to create your own workflow but it's a it's a it, it's it'd be lovely to have yeah. What, what if you wanted to make a zine on the go? What if you were traveling, right? And you only and you deliberately only had your phone or you were just doing a day out somewhere. And you think, you know, what, the, what I'd like to do is on the train on the way home from a day out, I want to throw a few things together and I want to print a zine and I want it to arrive in a few days at my house. You know, it's those kinds of accelerated workflows that I think I'd like to see, I think. And, and I think we're not too far from those. That it, it's, it yeah could be I mean it, it it's doable with with any technology I mean it's been doable for I mean, years it's just not perhaps a a big enough market I don't know and it's certainly not as seamless as you just just made it sound so um, just throw something together and bam have a have a zine arrive it's it, it's, it's more work than that but it, right now the tools are there it's possible to do this on the go mobile um, and we will have tools that are a lot more user friendly because you could just tell them what you want as in as like, like in star trek right you, you just say what you want and the computer figures it out so that's, <laughs> that would be that's, cool that's where we're Do going you, have you ever used um uh iMovie on your phone and uh, yes. used it and used it to create what they call a movie trailer rather than a free form edit yes i have and they they are these these pre predetermined styles and uh, and orders of things happening 
based yeah, but on it would say to you yeah. establishing shot here, close right. action shot here, close up right. shot here, and pick a pick music and we'll thread it. Uh, yeah. And it would say, okay, now you need some text here and some text there, and it, it you know, and it really took you through it all. So a, a guided, a, a guided, curated approach to a result that you know what it's going to look like. Yeah. But, AI. This is this is such no. an AI thing because because AI is so good at tutoring at, at at teaching you something. You will if if you if I I I would bet if you now go into uh, GPT four and use the right prompt to ask it to become a tutor for this and that or to take you by the hand to reach to make a film trailer. Here's the tools I use. Um, give me the step by step. Um, ask me questions if you need to. Um, you will probably be close in the result. Probably, I but so. I would still. But the thing is, you're you're down the um, you're down the path to yak shaving there, aren't you? Right. So yeah, do you, if if you know the the story of the yak no, shaving, I no. Okay. So I forget where it comes from. the 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 point is, it, it's somebody that you know is taking a walk, and he he comes across this guy who is shaving a yak. And he's like, "Why on earth are you shaving a yak?" And the uh, the answer is, well, I was going to do this, but then I realized I had to do that. And then I realized, I did, and, and then I needed a paintbrush, but I didn't have the right paintbrush and they didn't have it at the shop and I needed yak's hair. And so here I am, right? <laughs> and, and of course, it, by this point, is a million miles away from the original goal and the original thing that you wanted to do. Yeah, you suddenly find yourself, you know, doing something other. And, and what you've just described there is probably very true. But to do that, you know, to, to get that to happen, you need to learn how to program the AI or to, to prompt the AI, don't you? So so it's a whole different uh, exercise at that point. It's 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 moot, right? The point here is 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 a bit of fun conversation, right? Of so course. the bit of fun conversation <laughs> is that yeah, I've had I, I I bought a new editing tool. It has a slightly different way of working. I quite like the idea of of a tool like Capture One Mobile where they've sat back and they've thought, actually what do Capture One users really yeah, or what do the our target users really need from a mobile phone? Because you know, people who shoot in studios with tethered cameras don't edit the photos on their phone. So the last thing they need on their phone is a photo editor. But if you had a creative director in the studio with you and you could link their, you, you could automatically send stuff to their phone, that could be really useful, right? So it's just yes. the ways of working thing. I think, I think, I think we have, um, we have tapped into the purpose of this episode is to make everyone think of the future of photography, right? Yes, definitely. Uh, that we are very far in the future here. By the way, speaking of the future, um, there's a feature that okay. So so um, this podcast will be different than the others before. Oh, when okay. You, when you have this in your podcast player, because um, the, the, a tool that we use, a system that we use to make the the thing sound good and to do some metadata editing is called Ophonic, and Ophonic has just added a lot of AI features. Which include, <laughs> which include, and they have done this for a while, transcriptions. Um, we're not doing those, at least not officially. I'm doing them behind the scenes for a future possibly player where you can read along while we talk. Um, but another thing that they are just, that they, they just have announced, and this is a one-click operation, so I will try it out, is uh, AI chapter marks. So Ooh, okay. it, does, it takes the transcription, it tries to find structure in it, and it... it tries to extract Good luck with that. <laughs> different different blog well it it'll it'll seem as if we had planned this episode in detail very structured because it will find blocks of things we talk about and we'll put chapter marks in them so if you have a podcast player that supports it which should be all of them by now then uh, you will find the chapters and you can jump in between the different things that we talked about so, so, so if i say so, so i say something like moving on then <laughs> Right, the AI should find that and make a chapter marker. I don't know how it exactly does it, but um, it might be blocks of things that are con that are within a subtopic or something. That's we'll figure it out. We'll this... figure it out. I'm 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 looking forward to seeing what comes out. It will be not influenced by anything other than just the AI. I'll just let it happen. Uh, so so okay. 
That's, that, that'd be really interesting actually to to i had a bit of a play with some audio which i posted in our discord a few days ago uh i uh recorded you know just by speaking into my laptop or my desk no microphones other than the laptop microphones or anything a a an a, a, a not quite random, but a uh, a very ad hoc, you know, a stream of consciousness, three three minute stream of consciousness, you know, pretend yeah. podcast kind of thing, and then I went and used Adobe Enhance, which I know you've used, which which makes takes you know echoey takes audio, all the background out, <laughs> takes all the background out and makes it sound like it's recorded in the studio. So if you're recording off a a Duff microphone or in a very echoey room, it takes all that away. It sounded a bit muffled. You you look you lose some of the top end on it, but but for a one click operation, it's quite amazing. There's background. With you right now, I'm not taking this out. I'll leave this. Yes, in. sorry, it's been really noisy here today. Normally, it's yeah. quieter. Maybe that's because we're is in the air afternoon. show next to you or something. Uh, do you know I, there there isn't? I mean, there's a very famous air show that's about 15 miles up the road from here, or slightly less than that. But um, but some, one of my neighbours has decided to mow their lawn. Sorry, Saturday uh, afternoon. There we apologies. Go. <laughs> so it's a good test if because you know uh, hopefully by the time this podcast goes out, people won't be able to hear that. It'll no, be... I will. I will not fix that. I will not fix that. I'll leave that in. But the chapter marks will be AI generated. So check those out if your if your podcast player supports them. Um, okay. How about a few picks? That sounds I've, good. I've brought a pick. And no. it's a it's a it's a very process oriented pick. So what do you do? <laughs> <clears throat> if you see a lot of photos of something and the colors are important, I'm referring to New York. A oh, week okay. Or two ago. You remember the Canadian wildfires and the smoke coming down to New York, and then you saw Absolutely. all these photos of like a broad orange New York with very, very, um, very, very smoky, ap yeah, very, very limited. Yeah. Yes. It looked. It looked horrible. Um, to be honest, I feel Look, sorry for all the people that had to breathe all that in. It looked very Blade Runner twenty forty nine. It did, didn't and it? Yes. Yes. There were there were actually comparisons, and they were not far off. So, but of course, when you look at cameras these days, they will inevitably change something in terms of color. They are doing auto white balance. They're trying to figure out how bright a scene is and how green tinted mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, the light yeah. is and how to and try to fix that so the photos that i've seen i wasn't sure i could trust them right right okay and i've have had plenty of occurrences where i shot with a smartphone and the colors were changed oh yeah very much so yeah usually to the and better not just but a smartphone either Right. So um, I found someone who was like very process oriented there. Um, that person went outside with a color correction. Oh, card. wow. OK. Gosh. So what we're seeing is video. Someone uh, is carrying a laptop with a color correction card on the screen. I hope and he's calibrated his screen. <laughs> well, it, it looks like that. But, so the, the card looks rather neutral. So that um, orange sky and light outside looks like wow. it might possibly be that way. There's still a variance, of course, because it's on the screen. It's not an actual card. So it might the screen Gosh, might influence this. That really is very, very orange, isn't it? I mean, I've, I can only think of once or twice in my life I've ever actually been in something right. like that. Once was near a forest fire. Um, right. Another time is occasionally here in the UK we get Saharan dust sh clouds. Oh yes, we've had that. Yeah, um, uh, which come north, um, and yeah, they're occasionally very, very yeah, like once every ten years or so that can get quite thick. Yeah, but this is so, quite an amazing thing. Yes. Anyway, someone someone is a, is apparently a photographer and uh, did a good job uh, showing us that that was the actual color. So I really like that. It was wow. like, oh wow, yes, okay. good. But that's. that's 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 what that's what nerdy Chris would have done for <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, you don't trust me here. Now you can trust me. Yeah, I have a absolutely. gray card in the photo. Um, and you brought us some hardware. Oh yes, hang on, I can just reach over here. Oh, you have reach one. off camera. I have it here. Yes. So this continues my investment in the ten-year-old Nikon One system. <laughs> And I have uh, just purchased myself a nice little wide angle zoom. Uh, it is called the, uh, the the thing about this because it's a one inch sensor. The system it's a six point seven to thirteen millimeter lens, 
and and that might make you think wow that's got to be crazy uh wide but the, it's an equivalent of about an 18 to 35 because that system has a i think a 2.7 crop factor so uh i am yes so th- this is my pick of the week primarily because it only arrived two days ago and i'm having a big smile on my face playing with it um i it's have, really I have something lens. to add to that uh, you, you do know don komarechka photographer uh, uh yeah i i don't know him personally but i i know of his work yes he's the snowflake man amongst other he's things he's the snowflake he? man yes. among other things macro man now and uh he just gave his daughter a oh, hot pink nikon one nice <laughs> she turned seven and she got his old hot pink or i don't know if it was his but he that's got a, a good color that is isn't it yeah that's an i've got a pink color, one isn't it? i am on the lookout for a white one because i've got a couple of the white lenses so i am I on think the hot for pink would suit you well I, sh- I think you should try oh, it i could do that yeah i'm yeah, confident yeah. enough in you, who you i am as wear a person, that you can you wear know. that you can yeah, wear that that's i okay. could take that yeah <laughs> So uh, only if I had the lenses to go with it, though, I think a black lens on a pink camera probably you need you need to have the full effect. I think. But. Well, how not, why not mix and match? Is there a green that you could mix with a pink lens? I don't think they ever did a, green. A, so so they did black and, and a, white and a blue uh, a blue uh, shade. For that, you want the Pentax Q system, which did a, a, a come in met like thirty, forty different colours. I think you could get that. But that uh, yeah, with it interchangeable lenses. So check check that out, everybody. The Pentax Q system. That is one thing I've definitely thought about buying into over the years. All right. So we will be back next week with more. Let's see if, uh, if Jeremiah dug himself out from his night shoots. We'll be back soon. Until then, check out the chapter marks and see you. Bye. 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 been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Music